Hello. Hey, good evening. Good evening. So let's let's wait a minute as people are joining us and I know that the other panel is also still ongoing. Let's wait like one more minute. Oh, there's a there's a question. Why did I call it a crash course? Isn't isn't that like English colloquialism? Like a crash course is like super fast and maybe you you think it's too much to be a crash course? Like it should have been one hour or <laughs> or it's it's too little for a crash course? I don't know. It felt it, it felt pretty crashy to me at least. <laughs> like I'm never gonna do this again. <laughs> I mean, we are going through things that, you know, like this takes usually a little bit longer. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's wait like one or two more minutes. Ah, there he is. Okay. All right, so Mazin is here who will take care of the streaming, I assume. Dr. V, can you give me just one sec? Yeah, I can, I can give you even more than one second. All oh, right, a capsule course. Yeah, I, mm, I don't know. Yeah, I've never heard of a capsule course. Um, I don't know. I kind of like the idea of a crash. <laughs> <laughs> like a capsule seems more friendly. Uh, Right, Mazin, just just write in the chat when when the streaming is started or whenever you're ready or. We're ready to go. Ready to go. Okay, then I'm going to start. Um. Well, good um, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the last final day of the Old Nubian crash course. Um. For those who have not joined before, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Vincent van Gerven Um, And today we're gonna talk about Old Nubian sentences and subordination. And towards the end, I think we'll have some time. Um, we're gonna read, I hope, the first two pages of the Miracle of Saint Mina together uh, and, and see whether we can apply what we learned to an actual uh, text. Um, before that, however, I wanted to start with reading you something. Um, so, I don't know, these are, I mean, I feel that these are, are pretty uh, crazy times that we are living through. Um, and uh, I think that those times are also, or those, this, this current situation in which we are living through a pandemic, is also affecting to a large extent the university and academia and i myself am not in academia by choice um and i have noticed that i think most of at least the people that are joining here are not really attached to you know to hardcore academia as well maybe tonight the majority yes but 
I feel that at least in the field of new biology, there are many people that are not in, in academia. And I think that that is something that is really nice and refreshing and it gives a very good vibe to the field because I experience academia increasingly as a very toxic environment um, whenever I'm exposed to it, um, which I am uh, because of my, my, let's say my day job. Um, but I wanna read you something from um, the valedictory, uh, valedictory address of Gerald Brown. So Gerald Brown, in a, in a way, was my predecessor as scholar of Old Nubian. Uh, he died in 2004, he killed himself. Um, and um, in 2003, he, um, he gave an address at, uh, at, uh, at the celebration of his retirement. Um, and um, so this is, this is nearly 20 years ago. And so this is how he felt about academia. Um, I will close by observing what our university has now become. Whatever may have been the intentions of the supporters of the Morrill Act, which made the University of Illinois possible, he, he was at the University of Illinois, and of Abraham Lincoln, who signed the act into law, for most of the 20th century, the University of Illinois has been a research university doing only lip service to educating the young. This, I believe, is entirely appropriate, for not only is education dangerous to one's health, because of the reading that it involves, it is, as A.E. Hausmann once noted, one of the two causes of blindness in young boys. Education is also harmful to the very fabric of our republic, for our politicians would certainly derive no benefit from having an educated electorate. Presidents and senators may claim to be for education, he puts quote marks, but this is simple claptrap rhetoric designed to get votes. Voters capable of consecutive thought and well-reasoned argument would vote out of office the vast majority of today's and yesterday's politicians. For years, the University of Illinois maintained its position as a research institution, but recently, within the time of my tenure, an administration filled with failed academics actually began, began to believe that the purpose of a university is to educate the young. If our administrators were scholars, they never would have entertained such a preposterous idea. The university exists primarily to expand the limits of human thought. We academics have to teach for the same reason that we have to sponsor athletics. If we are to pursue research, we need money to put bread on the table. The fault for the mess in which our university now finds itself lies at least in part with me and with those other scholars who have steadfastly refused to dirty their hands with administration. Years ago, after I had been promoted to indefinite tenure, Ludwig Kunen told me that I thenceforth had the duty to become involved in the administration of the university. For, he said, if I did not, failed academics would become the administrators. And when that happened, the university as we know it would die. I thought Ludwig was exaggerating. After all, in those days, the University of Illinois, Dean Rogers, um, what, although hardly a great scholar, had at least some notion of what scholarship is. I naively assumed that his successors, his successors would have the intelligence, courage, and integrity to follow in his footsteps. Um, I, you know, for all his conservatism, because like in a way Brown was very conservative, um, I increasingly have the feeling that, that that the perspective or the future of scholarship lies outside the university. So in that sense, I, I, I tend to agree with him. Um, and, and I feel that what has been happening, you know, during new BFS and also during this, this course is something that, you know, that, that maybe is, is something like that of, 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 you know, of, of, of fostering scholarship outside the university, at least I hope it is. Um, I, I have taught Old Nubian, of course, within academic contexts, but I really feel that doing this outside to everyone and anyone who wants to listen is by far more interesting as a pursuit. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm very, I'm very thankful.
maybe that's what I want to say. I'm very thankful for you all uh, being here with me this, this past week. Um, and so on that note, um, let's get started. Um, so there are two, there, there are two things that we will still have to do before we can look at a real text, um, which is to discuss topic and focus um, and to discuss subordination. And so topic and focus is something that until recently was not very well described in Old Nubian. And, it, and, it's, uh, and it's related to two specific morphemes. So um, a topic marker, yon, uh, which has many different uh, phonological realizations and a focus marker law, which as you may recall uh, or may remember, this one looks a lot like a locative marker, um, but phonologically it behaves quite differently. So the way that we can often distinguish be between the two is that a locative marker uh, usually assimilates to the preceding consonant, whereas a focus marker never does. And so they, they behave differently and they're different morphemes for that matter. So. A, a topic marker, um, which marks always the first, the first constituent of the clause. So when you see a topic marker, you know you're at the beginning. So it's, it's very useful in order to find your way through a text where, you know, often interpunction is missing and everything is, you know, a scripta continua. It's like, it's, it's you know, concatenated words, basically. Um, it always marks the first constituent and it marks information that is already known to the listener. So um, it gives us the background of the story, basically, or the background of the sentence in, in this case. Um, a focus marker uh, marks new information. So you basically have this background foreground effect. And um, Old Nubian uses these topic and focus markers in order to structure the way in which information is delivered in a discourse. So in, in multiple sentences. So it allows you to connect or like, let's say to follow the stream of thought of the author. Um, we, we don't have anything really like that in English. Um, of course, there are all kinds of pragmatic, pragmatic things you can do in a sentence. You can, you can do syntactical stuff in order to move things to the beginning of the sentence that are more important than so on or that are new information but you cannot do anything morphologically in English. Um, in, in Old Nubian you can, and actually in many other languages you can, they have, they have similar types of system. Again, like funnily enough, Japanese has a, a, a topic marker um, that, that works kind of precisely like the way that the Old Nubian uh, topic marker works. Uh, also marking the first uh, uh, constituent in a sentence. Um, so let's, let's have a look at how that thing works. Um, I think I also is a very nice example. Unfortunately, the example is very damaged, but I, I think the reconstruction is is pretty okay, and it and it shows you uh, uh, how this works. So this is from John one one verse one. Um, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Um, and so what we see in the Old Nubian, and at least the first part of the verse is pretty well preserved, is that the word which is clearly new information, right? Because we're really at the beginning of the gospel. The word is here marked with a, um, a focus marker, right? Because it's new. Um, and then the second part of the verse, we know that with God or, you know, it's a dative. We can translate it within or at, uh, you know, a multiple uh, versions possible with profound theological implications. Um, let, let's stick with the standard with God. I think that's the standard St. James translation, um, uh, King James translation. Um, and we have presumably, at least it fits um, the word, which we now know uh, to exist, marked with a, uh, with a topic marker. Um, because by the second part of the verse, the word is known. Right, and then what is the new information is that the word resides uh, with God or at God or in God or whatever preposition you want to choose. Um, and so this, this works here very nicely because it, it's like the spotlight, right? So we, we go first to the word and then we go to, you know, with God. So those are the two new things that we need to absorb uh, at the beginning of this gospel. And it also works like in longer narratives, for example, the miracle of St. Mina has several very nice examples of this kind of spotlight thing working. Um, 
uh, in this case, so um, the translation is, as it was Sunday, the, the sailor went up to the village to receive the sacrament. In that village took the church of the Holy Virgin Mary. There he received, the, there he entered to receive the sacrament. So um, we already know from the story that it is Sunday, right? So as it was Sunday, so this, this gives us the background of the story. Um, then our sailor, our boatsman, goes up to the village. Uh, we, all, we always also already know that he is at a village because in the previous scene, he uh, 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 pulled his boat on the sand uh, at, at the village, down, down from the village. And then he goes up to the village because you have to climb the, the riverbank. Um, and so he goes up to the village to receive the sacrament. Then in that village, right, this gives us the next part of the background. So the first part of the background is it's Sunday, then he arrives in the village. In that village, now there is new information. There is a church of the Holy Virgin Mary. We didn't know yet. No one told us yet in the story that there's a church. This is new information. And we therefore see it marked with the focus marker. Then in the subsequent sentence, and in that church, right, we now know that the church is there. And so it becomes the topic, he entered to receive the sacrament. So here again, we see very nicely how, uh, how this kind of new information, old information structure uh, works. Now, um, I think I've said before that the, the, the focus marker, and we've seen it also in several contexts already uh, during this week, that, that um, the focus marker is obligatory in certain contexts. So for example, when you have a nominal predicate in a main clause, it is obligatorily marked with a focus marker. Now, when we think about that, that's a very logical thing because whenever you um, say that, you know, X is Y, then this Y, um, whatever X is, is, is by definition new information unless you're repeating exactly the same sentence, right? So when I say the weather is beautiful today, then that it's beautiful is clearly new information the weather is assumed as already something that we know that we're talking about, right? So if I say the weather is beautiful today, um, the weather is warm today, and the weather is uh, uh, with a blue sky today, then all of these three things are new information, right? And so whenever you do that, in Onubi, you need this focus marker. Um, so it, it, it follows logically from the way that we use nominal predication that it's always like new, a new piece of info. The same holds for a negation, right? So negation, again, is something that is marked, right? It's something that, you know, is, is, is marked clearly on the verb, but it's also like marked in terms of information. When we say that something is not happening, this is usually new information. Yeah. This is, it, it's rarely that we negate something and this is a well-known, you know, a well-known fact and so on. And, and so when something is negated in a main clause, we again find this uh, focus marker. So uh, this doesn't hold in embedded clauses, right? Because, or subordinated clauses. And that also kind of makes sense, right? Because what is subordinated is usually not the main theme of our conversation. It's not the main thing that you are supposed to listen to. Uh, it's background, it's additional information. It's, it's, you know, it's a caveat. And so the fact that we don't find focus markers in embedded or subordinate clauses is very logical because that's not the place where you hide your new information. And yeah, that's always gonna be in your main clause. Um, so that's how that works. By the way, if you have any questions, again, uh, you can put them in the chat or um, put them on Facebook if you're watching this on Facebook and I'll get them, um, I don't know, through signal or messages or people, I don't know. I, I usually get them somehow um, through one of the gazillion windows that are open in front of me. Um, so let's now go to the second um, uh, part, which is subordination. So subordination is, is when one sentence is subordinated to another one. In other words, it's less important. It uh, usually gives us uh, additional information about the events or situations that are happening in the main clause. Either you know they situate them in time, or or they give us reasons or causes, or they introduce some form of conditionality. Um, but uh, uh, they kind of they kind of 
they kind of situate you know, the main class. Um, and there are many ways in Nubian to do this. Um, what is important to remember is that, ex, you know, with a single exception, uh, namely final clauses or purpose clauses, um, Old Nubian subordinate clauses do not uh, have a predicate marker A attached to its verb, to its main, to its, to its, to its, uh, to its verb. So whenever you see a verb that doesn't have this predicate marker, there's a good chance that the thing is a subordinated verb and that you have to look a little bit further on to find the main verb of the clause. Um, furthermore, there are many ways to construct these uh, uh, subordinate clauses. So we have, we have a set of temporal clauses um, and they, they indicate things about like when, after, since, as, until, right? So they, they situate the main clause relatively in time. Um, you can do it, you can do a bare temporal clause, which basically is simply the verb, but without this uh, predicate marker. Uh, you can add uh, postpositions to it, like, or a locative and a locative with a postposition, or only a postposition. There are some conjunctions as and until that you can use. Um, let's see if there is an example. Oh, yeah, I gave a nice example here. So we have all the different variations. Um, I'm not gonna, you know, talk through all of them, but you can you can inspect them in your own time. Um, here, let's say this is the minimal variant, so a bare temporal clause while the boatman speaks. Um, then sometimes we have this with a perfective aspect, and in English sometimes you can you know you can use um, you can as a you can use a past tense as a translation uh, if if you like. Um, there are all kinds of other things that you can do with a locative, as I said, with a locative and a postposition. For example, these uh, conjunctions like until and as usually actually take per perfective aspect. So it's quite interesting that, that there are certain conjunctions that always take this perfective aspect and, and this is consistently shown in the texts, even in texts that otherwise don't really show anymore the retention of this uh, specific uh, morphine. Um, then we go to conditional clauses. Um, there are two, well, more, actually, there are more than two, I would say. Um, I think I only list two here, but there's like one that's really obscure. Uh, but I think there are only two in the slides. Um, there are two um, flavors, let's say. There's one that's very clearly visible uh, because it's introduced with this uh, uh, adverb alicin, if. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about what this uh, thing derives from or what it is and how it should be analyzed, but let's say just it means if, um, followed by a, a bare temporal clause, right? So here literally just have our subject, our object, and our uh, little verb. And notice again, there's no uh, predicate marker here. The predicate marker hides here under this epsilon, right? Because it's a sing first singular, so it's iota plus alpha becomes epsilon. So if the boatman kicks me, I go home. Um, and you can also do it uh, uh, co-referential, right? So this is non-co-referential in the sense that the, the subject of the uh, protasis is different from the subject of the apodosis, right? So we call the first part of the conditional clause usually uh, with a luxurious word protasis, and then the second part, the apodosis, like the conclusion, uh, or the premise and the conclusion, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so in this case, the subjects are different, right? The first the, of the protasis is a third person and with the apodosis is a first person. When it's a co-referential conditional clause, then we have both the subjects are the same, right? So this works similar as with the uh, relative clauses. Like there is, a, there's a, there is a morphological distinction between these two and we'll see exactly what that is. Um, so this type of construction you can do with either um, form. Um, oh wait, there's one uh, question here. Are the locative and focus marker diachronically of the same origin or just coincidentally similar? This is a very nice question. I do not know. Um, it could very well be that they were that they were developed in similar ways but at, at different points in time. So, so the question is actually, um, so whether this low 
basically our locative marker is the same as um, this law, right? And, and so uh, at least in Old Nubian, in the text that we have it, they behave differently phonologically, but that doesn't mean that they don't have the same origin. That is a correct uh, suggestion. Um, we know that the locative marker etymologically consists um, so the locative marker, this law, um, this one, etymologically consists of a determiner, L, and a, an old locative between quote marks that is in O. Um, there are several words in which we find only the O. And for example, the O is also found on uh, personal pronouns and on proper names. So that suggests that, you know, things that are inherently determined don't get law, but they get all. Um, so this is actually really quite nice that we can still see this. So we know that this is a determiner plus all. Of course, at some point people forgot that it is that and it just becomes treated as a single, um, as a single morpheme up to the point that actually in, in modern uh, now Nubian, I think the, the, the morpheme is simply this L, which has become an R. So this O has been dropped completely out of the morpheme. Um, for the focus marker law, that is consistently law. So um, it could either mean that that is uh, of a completely different origin, or it could be that it's simply older and there is even less understanding about the fact that that thing originally was two things. Uh, we don't know. Uh, the, the only, um, our only hope is to find similar types of constructions or morphemes in Meritic because uh, all the other Nubian languages have lost focus and focus and topic marking. So this is, this is something, this is a system that's also dying out. And you see this also in later documentary texts that people really don't know anymore how to use these morphemes. And they kind of, you know, use them in, in wacky ways. Uh, uh, especially this uh, topic marker, uh, or is it, or do we have this topic marker here, um, because it really looks like a conjunction on, and, and probably also etymology related to it, it becomes reinterpreted actually as a conjunction, uh, then used as such, like no longer as a topic, but this becomes like a conjunction. And, and, and so like people start to become a little bit uh, unsure about how to use this thing properly. Um, or properly, what do I know, right? They use it differently. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so this is still to be solved. Uh, what are the origins, whether they are similar or, or uh, uh, different? Um, all right, so we were at the conditional clauses. So, so with, with this alison and, and, and a, let's say, bare, uh, bare verb form, you can do both coreferential and non-coreferential. Um, however, there is a specific morpheme, this morpheme ko or ka, which probably relates to the, uh, to the uh, verb to have. So this is again, one of these incorporated verbs into your verbal complex. Um, you can make non-coreferential bare conditional clauses. So this is an example. So if the boatsman kicks me here with the ending kono, and so if this ko, then you have your um, person, your subject clitic, which is not obligatory, but it's really quite frequent. And uh, our locative marker, which, you know, as you can see, is undergoing all kinds of um, uh, phonological changes on the edge. So if the boatsman kicks me, I go home. Uh, I'm really sorry about how boring these examples are, but they're just, you know, to keep things consistent somehow. Um, but you cannot say, if I kick the boatsman, I go home. This is ungrammatical. Um, of course, how can I possibly make such a judgment? Uh, it's because I have all the conditional clause of Odumi in my head and uh, developed an intuition that this is ungrammatical. <laughs> um, it, it simply never occurs. So apparently you cannot use these forms for co-referential uh, conditional clauses. Why? We don't know, uh, but that's how it is. Um, then we go to final clauses. Um, so this is the one, uh, final clauses are, are uh, usually translated with in order to or so as to, like they're also sometimes called purpose clauses. Um, and 
again, we find a distinction between, on the one hand, uh, a specific morpheme that is for a co-referential final clause, nia or nua, which makes a distinction between singular and plural, but not otherwise, which is, which is interesting. Um, this is this is like say not typical like to have in, in the, this type of distinction doesn't really appear in the rest of the morphology you either distinguish all persons or none but like just singular and plural irregard, regardless of the of the person is something that that's actually unique to this specific morpheme and so it's amusing to see that precisely this distinction becomes completely confused in later texts and they're like they're just using ni or nu depending on the phonological context and they're like no longer seeing this as a meaningful distinction. But in older texts, or at least what I suggest is that this distinction is still there and people know very well which one to use where. Um, but because this contrast is so, it is not mirrored elsewhere in the verbal system, it becomes, you know, it becomes absolute. Um, the fact that you don't mark person, by the way, is logical because this is co-referential. So it means that we can deduct uh, the person from our main verb here. So if I go home, uh, I go home in order to kick the boatsman, right? So since this is co-referential, I know that the subject of this verb is the same as the subject of this verb, right? Um, and because I know the subject of this verb is the subject of this verb, it also seems to become irrelevant whether I mark this for singular or plural because I would already know, right? And so this is just, this is just let's say the, the laziness of the language user uh, that always tries to find, always who tries to cut corners. Yeah, that's how we use language to cut corners. Um, we have, uh, so this is the, the co-referential variant and then we have the non-co-referential variant with uh, unsurprisingly, a baked in uh, subject suffix, right? Because in this case, you actually want to know uh, who's doing it. Um, so we go home so that you can kick the boatsman, right? So we have two different, we have we and you, these are two different persons. Uh, and in this case, to make a purpose clause, um, you do need the non-coreferential uh, way of creating one of those, right? The one with co or ka. And note also that final clauses are the one exception where uh, you do find this predicate marker. And so the only thing that, that, that distinguish this verbal form from a conditional verb uh, is, is precisely this alpha, right? Um, causal clauses are because um, there are several ways in which we can do this. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are all these nice uh, postpositions you can use. They all derive from the same verbal root, Joe, to go. Um, they come with, you know, different types of case marking. Um, but as you can see, they all kind of follow the same type of pattern. So that actually finishes all the grammar we're going to discuss this week. Um, and so if there are any grammatical grammar related questions now, then I can deal with them now. And if there are none, then we can move onward to actually looking at some real text, which will pose immediately all kinds of problems with all the uh, explanations that I gave this week. Okay, so let's, let's actually look at a real text and, and see uh, if we can understand something. Um, so we're going to look at the miracle of Saint Mina. Um, it's, uh, it's my favorite story. It's such a fun, I mean, I've, I read this all the time in, you know, in different courses that I give of, of Old Nubian. It's a good introductory text because as you can see, the manuscript is really well preserved. So there are no terrible holes in it, uh, that make it difficult and we have to do reconstruction. None of that is necessary. Um, it is written by a well, I mean, a well-educated scribe. I mean, it's really nice letters. Um, and moreover, uh, the story, the way it is told really suggests that um, we're dealing with a uh, uh, quite possibly an actually uh, an originally Nubian story. There's no, there's, I mean, Mina was a uh, Coptic saint, but there is no rec record of this specific story. And also I think the way in which the sentences flow are just so natural compared to some of the other like texts that we know to be translations that I sometimes, you know, have the, have the, have the intuition between God and Marx that this is an original Nubian composition. 
there's of course uh, no positive evidence for that. I mean, it's it's a, it's a thesis. It's like it's a it's a hypothesis, but it's uh, not something that I can prove in any in any specific way. Um, that being said, there are no mistakes in this text that point to a specific translation mistake. Right? So some of the translations clearly have mistakes in them in terms of interpreting the Greek. And you can see how like he misread this Greek word and therefore the translation is wacky. There is none of that in this text. So that, that, that gives me hope that my hypothesis may actually be true. Um, but, but it remains your hypothesis. So um, we're going to have a look at the first two pages. Um, here you see very nice with this, these nice decorations. And we have this beautiful uh, 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 heading here in, in red ink. Um, and so let's let's have a look at the actual text. So um, it starts with the with the title, um, which is uh, "This is a miracle that Saint Mina, the martyr of Christ, uh, performed." Um, as you can see here, this entire thing is a nominal clause. Um, so that's the first thing that we should really uh, understand, right? So we have this law here at the very end preceded by this alpha, um, suggests that this whole thing is a nominal predicate. There is no other uh, verb in here. Um, there is no subject. Um, so this is a clause of the variant, it is X. And then what I have marked here is X. Um, and then so we, we start working backwards because that's usually the, the best way to do this, right? So we have a verb to do here with a uh, past tense, a uh, second past. Um, and we're going to look for the subject of this, uh, of this verb. Um, now we are in a relative clause. So the subject can be either um, marked with a determiner or with a genitive. Uh, and in this case, um, it is a, a genitive because, um, because it's this one. Um, because what we're looking at is we have an antecedent here. It is a miracle that, right? And, and how do we know that, that this is the antecedent? It's well, because we know that a predicate marker is distributive. So it is attached to both our relative clause and our antecedent. And so, it is, it is a miracle that mm performs. Now, who is the mm that performs? This. Saint Mina, Nisu Mina na, so a genitive marked subject, uh, who is also the uh, martyr of Christ. And as you can see, all of this precedes Mena which then tells us that this is a restrictive reading in the sense that, you know, you cannot really talk about Mina without also mentioning that he's a saint and a martyr of Christ, which is precisely what he was, uh, right? He was one of these military saints that was, uh, that was very popular in, in early Christianity. Um, and, uh, and he died uh, while fighting in the army or I don't know exactly know how, the, how this man died. He, you know, he was in the army, he professed his faith in Christ and people didn't like it. And at some point he got killed. Um, so we have now our first clause, and this is actually not the easiest clause in the sense that it's, this is a construction that, you know, you only really find in titles. Um, but it is analyzable with what we have learned this week. If we just walk through it systematically, um, then we have our little, uh, you know, in the peace of God, amen. Um, this is just a little, uh, a little phrase. There is no verb going on here. We have amen here and the word for peace in the peace of God, God marked with the genitive marker uh, and here a locative on peace. So in the peace of God, uh, it's a rather standard phrase uh, um, in, in multiple religions. Then um, our story starts. And so very frequently in Onubian, when a story starts, the audience is addressed and it's always addressed with on takira gueka, beloved, uh, which I think is a wonderful way to address your audience. Um, it's also my Twitter handle. Um, this is a, um, a uh, 
let's say a nominalized verb form. So it, we have a verbal root to love. Um, we have a passive morpheme, so to be loved, then a present tense marker and a plural a predicate marker. Um, that is usually used, um, we didn't talk about this, but the predicate mark can also be used uh, in lieu of a vocative, right? So that's what we're dealing with here. And then also this ke additionally marks this as an appeal, like as something that is called out to somebody else. Um, oh, you beloved. Oh, you that are, oh, you that are loved, something like that. Beloved. Um, it's a very frequently occurring uh, phrase. So now we know that we're at the beginning um, and uh, we get our first introduction to our story. Um, let's see, uh, so this is our sentence. Um, we need to figure out where's our verb. Well, our verb is right here. It's not at the end, um, but it's nearly at the end. So the only thing that follows here is an adjunct. It gives us some more location information. So adjuncts you can, can, be, uh, can be following the verb. So that sometimes happens. Um, so we have uh, a verb here. It's a verb to exist um, with a past tense marker and a predicate marker. So we can already see that there is no subject lytic on this verb, right? That means that our subject, we expect it to be explicit, right? Um, because if it's not explicit, we see a subject marker, or if it's topicalized, we see subject marker. When we see no subject marker, then we must look somewhere in the sentence where is a nominative case mark uh, thing. And it's right here where it should be. Uh, at the beginning, um, a woman. So also note here the usage of this well uh, uh, one. So like a specific woman or a certain woman, maybe we can even say in English, a certain woman was living. Um, we see the focus marker law here. So this is new information. This is true. We only just started the story. We have no idea what this is about, but we know there's a certain woman who is existing or living in a certain village in a, uh, or a city even like dip can also be city. Like this is a little bit uh, tendentious translation um, in a locality, if we want to be neutral about it. Um, a specific locality that shall not be named. Actually, we don't really figure out uh, what the name of this locality is, but we know that it's in the district of Alexandria, um, which is in the north of Egypt and which is, you know, relatively close to um, to where the action is happening, right? So we there is there's a reasonable uh, uh, like this is a reasonable place for this woman to live, considering that the action is going to take place in Mariotis which is, you know, just a little bit to the, uh, to the west of, um, uh, of Alexandria. So there we have our first sentence. Then we, of course, would like to know what's going on with this uh, woman. Oh. Um, and we are introducing it in the, in the second sentence, what precisely is her issue? Um, she remained barren and bore neither son nor daughter. So, um, knowing that we are uh, here in the past tense, we, you know, possibly expect that another past tense uh, verb will follow, and indeed it's here, uh, she uh, remained barren. So, um, and, and bore neither son or daughter. So this is a little bit of a complicated sentence. We see here the verb to bear, uh, past tense and a predicate marker. Um, followed by this um, uh, auxiliary. And so this is already quite interesting. Why, for example, don't we find uh, to bear directly with a negative suffix? Why is the auxiliary construction used? I don't know. Um, maybe it's because the whole thing is stop focus marked and maybe that's why, you know, you cannot do that, but then again, Focus marking happens all the time on negative verbs. So like, why, you know, why would you need this type of construction? We just simply don't know. Like I have no explanation why they chose to say it like this. Um, furthermore, we see our subject right here. It's topic marked um, because she has been introduced, right? In the previous sentence. So she is old information. We're now gonna talk about this certain woman in a district of Alexandria. And um, therefore, she is topic marked in, in this sentence. And therefore, we also find this uh, subject critic 
uh, on our main verb, right? This is our main uh, verb, an auxiliary, that, and this is the meaning carrying verb, let's say, of that, of that construction. Now, um, we see here that there's also these two verbs here, a verb to be barren or to be infertile um, with a predicate marker. So we know this is a converb. Um, but then there is this verb to sit with a conjunction attached to it and nothing else. Um, we know from modern Nubian languages that the verb to sit is used for habitual constructions. However, it is not at all used in other literary texts. So is this spoken language that infiltrates into a naturally told narrative rather than something that's translated word by word from Greek? Maybe. Um, that, that could be an explanation of why this specific uh, progressive auxiliary or whatever you want to call it is, is used in this, in this context. But we can understand it thanks to uh, our knowledge of, of, of uh, uh, present-day Nubian, now Nubian languages. So we know that she, is re she remained barren, so she was in the process, she was constantly remaining barren, and um, she bore no son, uh, neither son nor daughter, right? So we have here these two, neither son nor daughter, again with this conjunction and the ende, and two accusative marked things. And these things are the objects of Unara mena lo. Um, your question is, of course, what is the object doing after, you know, behind a verb? Well, this is one of these cases where heavy constituents can be extraposed behind the main verb because this is this is a conjoined. These are two conjoined noun phrases. And these count as heavy, and so you can you can let's say leave them behind the main verb. So we already see that in the second sentence there are actually quite a number of things that we are unprepared for, right? So this construction, we had no idea it existed. Before I saw this text, I had no idea it existed. There is an auxiliary construction that we cannot explain why it is here and why they wouldn't say it in the other way. Um, and we have, we are dealing with something syntactical, namely like a heavy object that is extra posed and that we also didn't know you can do, but you can. Um, so even this like rather, you know, in the end, simple text and comprehensible text, once we start to look at the details, like there's a lot of nitty gritty syntactical, syntactical stuff that's going on. Um, oh, by the way, there was a question of so here about the previous uh, uh, sentence and where the question whether this la, this dative can be also with locative meaning, the answer is yes. Like in many other languages, a dative can be multiple things and it can also indicate location yeah um why the locative is used and not uh, sorry why the dative is used and not the locative i will not be able to tell you um right so why the dative here why twice uh, i don't know um i don't know okay. so let's look at the next sentence so we know that she was barren, she couldn't bear any children, no son, no daughter. This is of course a big issue because you know, uh, you're living in a society where childbearing uh, is, uh, is valued and is highly practical uh, in order to enhance your chance of survival. Um, and so this is obviously the problem that St. Mina is going to solve towards the end. And the story is about how he does that. Um, now, she had many other things, right? So she had no children, but she was very wealthy. And that's what, we, what is explained here. So in abundant wealth, she possessed much, but she had no hair. Um, so we have here, um, um, where is our main verb here? Uh, enona. Again, an auxiliary. This is again crazy, like we have this, we have what appears to be not even an auxiliary construction, but this is a converb, as you can see. There's no tense marking at all, but it's a converb marked with a focus marker, which hardly ever happens. Um, then there is this, you know, nicely uh, inflected uh, copula, auxiliary maybe, um, and a... Um, uh, and an object, right? So 
she, she is not expressed here, but uh, explicitly, but we have, uh, of course, our subject uh, litig here. So she um, was having, or she had, um, much wealth in abundance. M abundant wealth, she was, she was very wealthy, something like this. Um, and moreover, the second part of the sentence, or actually a new sentence with a new verb, this time um, with, a, with a very nice uh, negative suffix here and as expected, a focus marker. So, um, but she had no heir. So this is, this is actually a, a contrastive construction, right? Um, where we contrast on the one hand, her abundance of wealth and on the other hand, the absence of heirs. And so maybe that could explain what is going on here, right? Because you want to construct, you want to, you want to, um, pragmatically, you want to contrast having and not having, right? The having of a lot of wealth and the not having of an heir, which is of course an enormous problem. And so perhaps this is simply the only way in which you can have a focus marker on your main verb that is not a negation and is uh, a not uh, uh, a nominal uh, predicate, right? Maybe this is simply the only way in which you can make this construction. That may be an explanation, but as we have no other examples of it, we don't know. Um, oh, why is this um, sharing my up? And so talking about this thing hurt her heart. Um, so here we have um, our subject. This is again kind of crazy. This is also not something that you see very often, but so the subject seems to be um, headed by this verbal form marked with a predicate marker. This is, this is already quite weird. Um, it may have to do with the fact that the verb to say or e um, in general hardly takes any morphology. Um, so it's a bit of a defective verb. And so like, you know, like, like Latin inquite, for example, like these are kind of baked forms that really don't take much else in terms of morphology. So maybe that's what's going on here, but we don't really know. Uh, we can interpret the sentence, however. Uh, uh, we can see the main verb is here, so it's to afflict. Um, transitive marker, it's in the past, there's a third person um, uh, uh, subject, which is this thing that is topic marked. Um, and it, it caused affliction, maybe this is how we could translate it, to her heart, or it afflicted to her heart, um, or her soul, or whichever translation you prefer, her heart soul. Um, and what is afflicting her heart is... Um, saying about this thing. So talking about it, telling about it, uh, talking about this thing afflicted her heart, right? Um, so this Julia here, this construction of Julia plus a genitive is usually translated with about, about this thing. Talking about this thing hurt her heart. Oh, why does it constantly go to the wrong thing? Um, and then to drive the point home, um, not only she was infertile or barren, her entire household uh, was afflicted. So this was, this was you know, a real issue. Um, all who lived at her house were barren, the servant girls, the cows, up to the fowls. Um, and so again, we see our sentence here and we're like, okay, where is our verb? Um, is right here. Um, Again, this is really interesting um, because we find um, this uh, copula here um, with a nominal predicate. They were barren. Um, again, not something that we expect. Usually you only find a copula plus uh, uh, a nominal predicate in embedded clauses, but this is clearly a main clause. So maybe again, it has to do something with this focus marking right here. Maybe there's just no other way you can do this then this way. That would suggest that this construction is quite similar to what's happening here. Same thing, right? This type of copula, auxiliary, whatever it is, 
and then we have a verb marked with with the alpha and focus marking and the same thing seems to be happening here um, it could be a suggestion that this is quite similar in construction right but again like we don't we don't really know uh, how that works um, but fortunately we can interpret what's going on so that's important um, so we know that this is a third plural thing um, we know that the verb is I, that the subject is either not expressed or it's topicalized. So in this case, we find a topic marker. So we know since the topic marker always marks the first constituent that this entire thing is our uh, uh, noun phrase that starts uh, that is a subject of this verb, right? So then we just go and we interpret what's going on. And so we have a word for also here, a determiner here that's uh, assimilated. Uh, we find the word all, um, and we know that this is a predictive quantifier. We know that it usually follows a relative clause, and we know that that relative clause is usually marked with a predicate marker, which is right there, right? So we know that all who, da -da 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 -da, well, what does it say here? All who lived or existed in her house. So everyone who existed in her house was barren. Right, and we see that this is plural, and also this is uh, plural marked. And then we have this whole bunch of things that uh, follows the main verb at the end. So we know that you know this is either uh, additional information, or maybe it's a heavy thing because it's several things that are conjoined, or something like that. Um, and that's actually true um, because this actually lists everyone who is living in her house, namely uh, the servant girls or the girls of the servants, uh, it would be another way to, uh, to translate it, uh, the cows and uh, up to the fowls, so, or the chickens, right? So all the animals and, the, the, uh, and her servants, they were also barren. And so this, um, let's see a question here. Is the auxiliary construction found in any other text? So um, this specific, or especially this specific auxiliary construction is, if my memory serves me well, only found in this text. Um, it could very well be that um, this is not a construction that you would use or would need to use in a literary translation. But this is something that you would regularly do when you're telling a good story uh, in your native language. Um, Oh, uh, so uh, yeah, um, uh, if, if we had more attestations of this specific construction, I would be able to say more about it uh, than I have. Uh, we, we don't. Um, and then so as how do you distinguish relative clause from main clauses? Well, relative clauses, you, um, do you mean so that it's difficult to know that this is a relative clause because there's the alpha here? Is that, is that the reason for your question? Oh, yeah. Is, is for example the first sentence um first i mean first the very first very first one yeah i think there's a relative clause that um yeah it, uh, yeah uh, this is a miracle and that mm -hmm. uh, yeah after that it's relative clause but maybe you can also say like like ngokura and this is one sentence and the is another sentence. Yeah, you can say this. I mean, I mean, like, there is nothing that prohibits us from saying, translating this as, this is a miracle, this is done by uh, the Holy Minos, the, the, uh, the martyr of Christ. Um, okay. I take my hint from the interpunction, um, in this case. Uh, so the interpunction helps us here understanding that this is one thing, and also mm -hmm. because in the end, when you say this is a miracle, this is uh, done by Saint Mina, the martyr of Christ, you're saying the same thing. It has the same information value as saying this is a miracle mm -hmm. done by, uh, by, the holy, by Saint Mina, the holy martyr of Christ, right? I mean, these are, this is technically the same thing. So uh. since we know that um, the predicate marker is distributive and attaches to both the antecedent and the relative clause. I mean, I don't see a reason why to, to translate this in a, in a different way. Um, yeah. yeah. And there's no relativizer in Onubian? Or... 
no like, no uh, we don't in... there's no i mean there is there's this this pronoun right that uh, the, this demonstrative pronoun that can sometimes be used as a relative uh uh, uh relative pronoun but it's rare and it's mm -hmm. definitely not happening in this text if okay. memory serves me well yeah it, uh, it seems um, to be really a literary art artifice i see Maybe this genitive is can be a marker of relative clause. Menana. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. The fact that that the subject is marked with a genitive tells me that this is a relative clause. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, together with the fact that you would never see a form like this as a uh, as a regular verbal form. Mm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, let's see, I think that, that the files was actually the, the last. Yeah, and so, yeah, so this is the last, uh, this is the last sentence. Oh God, it's eight o'clock already. Uh, is there anyone after me? Yes, there is. Okay, um, I really cannot make this too long. Um, so this is the last, uh, uh, these are the last two pages and I just put it here because um, it features Saint Mina here. So this is like, this is kind of the key scene of the whole story, right? So. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to tell the whole story because I don't have time for it. But in the key scene there, you have St. Mina on a white horse with a big lance. And uh, the three crowns are not in the story, but he usually is depicted with three crowns. Um, he is on his white horse in a shining armor in the middle of a church. And if you're in a Nubian church, these places are tiny. So this was like, I mean, the church was full with that. And we see here the, the boatsman... Um, and Saint Mina kicks him on the head, which is is easy because like he is like literally bowing down and he is on his horse, so he can kick the head. And he is this man is then giving birth to a chicken, which you see underneath here. And then the chicken is brought by Saint Mina to the woman, and then the chicken makes everybody fertile, and they all give birth to multiple children, and they're all baptized and become good Christians. That's the end of the story. Um, yeah, the, yeah, that, that's that. You know, that's how it goes. You know, you get the chicken that makes everybody fertile, and you become a Christian. So, so there, there should always be a payoff. Like, never convert for nothing. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, what? Oh, oh my God! It did the same thing. So, and, and that's it. Um, that's the end of the old Nubian course or crash course. Um, I don't think I have time for many more questions because I uh, I have to close because there's another panel coming after me. But I do again want to thank you for your attention. I will put again this lecture up on YouTube together with the slides, and uh, I I you know I encourage you to uh, to continue your studies in this language, which has very 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 few scholars, uh, and which definitely could use a couple of more because we have a lot of work to do. So. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I hope to see you somewhere in real life or virtually in the future. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention this week and, and joining this course. And I hope you enjoy the rest of Nubia Fest. Um, I am going to um, shut this down now. So uh, goodbye. <laughs>